So we're on chapter 25 in your world history book. We're going to the end of the chapter, getting to the end of World War II, Victory in the Pacific. As you can see in this picture, how happy Americans are um, over the victory uh, and the surrender of Japan here. So, so let's go on and see how um, the Japanese surrendered. So, and of course, if you're going to look at this picture, you'll be seeing this um, picture on Iwo Jima, a famous um, memorial for World War II. So, that iconic photo. So let's begin. B-29s and submarines. At the beginning of 1945, Japan had clearly lost the war. But the Japanese home islands had not been invaded except by the Doolittle invades, which, which had actually terrorized them, um, but they had no further invasions. So the Japanese refused to acknowledge their defeat. So the B-29 raids against Japan's industries and submarine attacks were launched upon her shipping. So we kept um, now raiding Japan and the industries and the submarines um, and onto her shipping, um, it was going on, the tax against Japan. And late in 1944, the American B-29 Super Fortress bombers began bombing Japan's major cities on a daily basis. So now the mainland is being attacked. American submarines disrupted the communication and commerce systems of Japan. And American submarines actually had sunk 167 Japanese warships and 1,089 merchant vessels. Still, Japan did not surrender. Iwo Jima. So on Iwo Jima here, this picture you see is from that, that battle. Let's find out about Iwo Jima. Halfway between Saipan and Tokyo, Tokyo lay a tiny volcanic island called Iwo Jima, which means Sulphur Island. The Japanese aircraft was based on Iwo Jima, and this is where um, Americans wanted to have a base there um, so that they could be in preparation for invasion of Japan. So after months of heavy naval bombardment, U.S. Marines landed on Iwo Jima on February 1945 to make this island. We, the United States wanted to make this island their base so that they can continue to um, bombard uh, Japan. After a month of the most desperate fighting in human history, notice that, the most desperate fighting in human history um, the United States overcame the Japanese resistance on this island. Can you believe it? 6,000 Marines were killed, along with 20,000 Japanese defenders on Iwo Jima. So you, when you look at this picture, you look, that battle was pretty horrific. As they fought to get the top of the mountain to put up the American flag, they were bombarded. There's actually movies on these men from Iwo Jima. One of the most memorable photos of World War II, this is the photo I've been talking about, shows a group of Marines raising the American flag on Iwo Jima's Mount Suibaki. There you go. So there's the picture. They're raising the flag. These guys became national heroes because of this picture and because they survived, right? Or not, I don't think all of them did survive, but. Okinawa. The battle for Onoka, Okinawa was even more intense than Iwo Jima. Can you imagine that? Okinawa was 350 miles from the Japanese homeland. Not very far. It's kind of like the distance between um, San Francisco and LA, you know, three, only 350 miles. The Japanese offered desperate resistance, of course, being so close to their homeland. The U.S. Marines overran the northern half rather quickly 
after their landing on Okinawa on April 1st, 1945. So the northern half was a piece of cake, right? But the U.S. troops, troops suffered how many? 45,000 casualties in their attempt to capture the southern half of, Iwo, of Okinawa. The Japanese um, sacrificed their largest battleship, the Yamato. The Yamato um, was, was basically a suicide run. So they took their battleship and ran it into the entire American fleet, destroying their own ship so that they could destroy um, the American, um, the, as many as American ships in the American fleet as possible, a suicide um, battleship. Can you believe that? Also, there were 5,000 kamikaze suicide planes loaded with explosives, explosives against the Allied vessels. So these planes, these guys in these planes, they would just fly their plane right into um, ships and right into other planes and right into uh, where the American soldiers were and they would kill themselves in the process. That's why they were called kamikazes. About 12,000 Americans were dead and 36,000 were wounded at Okinawa. That's a lot of Americans. 12,000 Americans were dead. 36,000 wounded. Here are some of the pictures on Okinawa. The Potsdam Declaration. President Roosevelt, FDR, he was reelected to a fourth term. He's actually the only president to be reelected to a third or fourth term. And they only did that because it was wartime. So in 1944, this would be his fourth term. But... On April 12th, 1945, FDR, President Roosevelt, he died suddenly of a stroke. Hmm. And now Vice President Harry Truman became president. In the summer of 1945, now Truman would meet with Joseph Stalin, President Truman of America, Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, Russia, and the British Prime Minister now was Clement Attlee, and they met in Potsdam, Germany, um, to decide what was going to be done in the midst, you know, Japan had not surrendered yet. Now, Churchill's Conservative Party was defeated for a while. That's why Attlee now was in, in charge for this short time. And then Churchill Hill was reelected. But on July 26, 1945, President Truman and Prime Minister Attlee joined by radio with Chinese General Chiang Kai-shek, and they issued this Potsdam Declaration to, um, to Japan, too, for Japan to surrender. And Chiang Kai-shek being naturally not communist, China at this time was not communist China. It was a na a na run by national, the nationalist Chiang Kai-shek. Calling upon the Japanese to surrender unconditionally and withdraw to the home islands. That's what they were doing. They were calling upon Japan to surrender. This promised that the Japanese would not be enslaved nor destroyed. They said, we're not going to put you, we're not going to enslave you. We're not going to destroy you. We want peace with you. Just surrender. But did they surrender? No. Here's a picture here. Stalin here, Russia, and Truman, and this is Churchill at this time. It's when Roosevelt, uh, President Roosevelt died. So now, what are we going to do now? Japan still refuses to surrender. The Japanese fanatics and militarists refuse to heed the Allied call to surrender. They insist that the Japanese people would rather die than submit, than surrender. This would lead to the Manhattan Project. So remember the Manhattan Project? Well, you'll find out what it is. Very important. The Manhattan Project in uh, the Manhattan area. But they labeled it the Manhattan Project. So what is this project? Well, I'll look at the pictures and you can kind of tell what this is. Hmm? In an agonized decision, President Truman finally decided to use the atomic bomb, 
The Manhattan Project was the atomic bomb. To use the atomic bomb against Japan in order to save the lives of thousands of American servicemen and countless Japanese who would have been slaughtered in an invasion of Japan. Okay, it was to um, cause a cause for peace. Yet, what a cause, a bomb, an atomic bomb. The Manhattan Project was the largest research and scientific effort of its day. Because during the 1930s, the Germans took an early lead in atomic research. Uh, but they persecuted the Jews. And so these Jewish, mainly Jewish scientists, had to leave um, in order to, due to the Holocaust, right? So they had been driven um, out. And um, they had, in fact, had driven out many talented nuclear physicists to the refuge in the United States. So they came to the United States for refuge against, they were totally against Hitler, Adolf Hitler, and what he was doing, especially the persecution of the Jews. The Americans' willingness to protect the Jews was one of the most, the primary reasons that the atomic bomb was developed in the United States and not in Germany. So now we had the talent here and to devise this Manhattan Project. There were warnings. The first warning was with Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein wrote a letter to President Roosevelt warning him that the Germans might produce an atomic weapon that the United States should begin this research in this area immediately, thinking, what if, just what if, Germany had the atomic bomb? What if what, a dictator like Mussolini or Hitler or um, the military in Japan had the atomic bomb? You know, we may not have a world here today. So here we have some of the scientists that were involved in the um, uh, production of the atomic bomb. Enrico Fermi, right there, who, who um, fled from fascist India, or fascist Italy under Mussolini. So he fled to America in 1938 before the war, before America entered the war. Edward Teller, a Jewish immigrant from Hungary, um, fled to America and J. Robert Oppenheimer, an American-born Jewish physicist, um, also helped to produce the atomic bomb. Okay, the atomic bomb was tested in New Mexico in the desert in July of 1945. Can you imagine at this testing, everybody came, you know, people from all over, you know, tourists. Well, we're gonna watch this uh, testing of this bomb. It's gonna be like fireworks, huh? <laughs> That was ridiculous, I mean, especially because they, they, they didn't really know so much about radiation sickness, so a lot of them probably got sick, I don't know. But here they are gathering to watch the testing of the atomic bomb in New Mexico. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. On August 6, 1945, a solitary B-29 flew high in the skies above Hiroshima and dropped a single atom bomb equivalent in power to 13,000 tons of TNT. 92,000 Japanese were dead and the city was devastated. On August 9th, three days later, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, killing 40,000 people in Japan. You can see this picture here. It destroyed 62,000 buildings and killed those up to 92,000. Some of them died later of radiation poisoning. You can imagine the devastation here as you look at the picture of the atomic bomb. This is the way the bomb looked before when they dropped it. And what a deal, huh? Japanese surrender, Japan surrenders. The Soviet Union, another enemy of Japan, declared war on Japan the day before the bomb dropped on Nagasaki. So now the Japanese leaders realized that further resistance was futile. The fear of their cities being destroyed one by one by atomic bombs persuaded them to go for peace. 
on August 10, 1945, they asked if acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration would mean the forceful abduction of the Emperor Hirohito. They loved their emperor. They considered their emperor like a god. So they were wondering, well, what, what are they going to take and kill Hirohito, our, our emperor? Well, the allies replied that his future, Hirohito's future, was in the hands only of the Japanese people. And then the Japanese accepted the declaration as the allies said they would not harm Hirohito. So Emperor Hirohito um, told the Japanese by radio that they had indeed lost the war. Here we have a picture of Hirohito here, and here he is um, as he, he's declaring the end of the war in Japan. And here we have uh, the signing there, Japan signing and surrendering. Um, actually, in the midst of all this, um, Japan did sign on a ship with um, General MacArthur. We'll find that out in a little bit, I think. VJ Day, September 2nd, 1945. So Allied forces under General Douglas MacArthur, member of the Philippines in the Philippines, he, they anchor their, their ship in Tokyo Bay and give the terms of surrender and arrange that with Japan. So on September 2nd was a victory over Japan Day, or they call it VJ Day. The Japanese surrendered aboard the American battleship USS Missouri. So like I said, uh, General MacArthur comes in now and he um, relates to Japan what what the terms of surrender were, and they come on the boat, the USS Missouri, uh, and sign the documents to end the war. General MacArthur became the military governor of Japan as American troops moved to occupy Japan. So, and General MacArthur treated Japan, the people of Japan, fairly indeed. I really like General MacArthur. I believe in him talking about um, basically that um, we needed to be born again, is what he said, <laughs> you know, knowing that he was a Christian. The long war in Asia began, or the long war in Asia, begun in Manchuria in 1931, was at last over. The war in Manchuria was over. <coughs> the war Japan in the Pacific was over. Um, the war in Europe was war over. World War II was over. General MacArthur's words to the American people. I love this part. So listen to what he says. Today, the guns are silent. A great tragedy has ended. A great victory has been won. A new era is upon us. Victory itself brings with it a profound concern, both for our future and future security and the survival of civilization. Men since the beginning have sought peace. Military alliances, balances of powers, leagues of nation all in turn have failed, leaving the only path to be by the way of the crucible of war. The utter destructiveness of war now blots out this alternative. We have had our last chance. If we do not devise some greater system, Armageddon will be at our door. I love this part. He says, the problem basically is theological. I mean spiritual. He says, the problem basically is theological and involves a spiritual recrudences, which means rebirth. So he was saying, what is going to solve this problem of world wars? He said, being born again, the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Don't you love that? What a way from MacArthur speech at the end of World War II. If only we knew that we need to, to reach the world with the gospel, that only through the gospel 
are we going to able to have peace? Jesus, Maranatha.